morning. It's Wednesday, August 20th, and as this day begins, the White House says it won't impose tough sanctions against South Africa. Fires in the West are now threatening homes near Los Angeles, and the Indian bar mitzvah boy may not be a chief after all. In sports, it's the dreaded cutdown day in the NFL. Jimmy Cephalo has that and a slugfest in baseball. Joe Witte is watching record heat and some severe thunderstorms, and Alan Abelson looks at how tax reform will change American business. I'm Bob Jamison, and this is NBC News at Sunrise. The White House is making it clear this morning that the administration has no intention of toughening sanctions against South Africa on its own. A year-old executive order that contains limited sanctions expires September 9th. But as Steve Porter tells us, it will apparently be renewed with no change. A published report which said Chief of Staff Donald Regan would join in recommending to the President additional sanctions was denied by Regan. He said the recommendation would be that the President go ahead and extend the current non-punitive sanctions which expire on September 9th. As far as additional sanctions, we have no plans at the current moment for any by the President by himself. He said the policy remains trying to build bridges to the various factions in South Africa and that sanctions would undercut that effort but he didn't rule out tougher action in the future. We never know what is going to happen and what turn uh, events will take, so you don't uh, finally slam the door on uh, every possibility. I just left the door open uh, a little bit. At this point, I would not recommend additional sanctions. Regan indicated he feels there are enough Republicans in the House who object to tough sanctions to block a veto override. Part of the strategy is to involve the House in lengthy debate, slowing down the sanctions steamroller. That could delay action until after Election Day maybe even long enough for time to run out on this session of Congress. Steve Porter, NBC News, with the President in California. President Reagan has made some tough comments about Nicaragua to a Mexican newspaper. Mr. Reagan said the only alternative in Nicaragua may be for the Contra rebels to take over. Unless the Sandinista government agrees to a peaceful settlement, he said, the U.S.-backed rebels may well overthrow the leftist regime. There are primary results from Wyoming and Utah this morning. In Utah, real estate salesman Craig Oliver narrowly defeated Terry Williams, Utah's only black state senator, for the Democratic nomination to oppose Senator Jake Garn. In Wyoming, lawyer Mike Sullivan won the Democratic gubernatorial nomination to succeed retiring Governor Ed Hirschler. And Dick Cheney, Wyoming's only congressman, easily won renomination in the Republican primary for a fifth term. The federal budget deficit is once again worse than expected. White House budget officials say Congress will have to come up with another $10 billion in spending cuts by October to meet the Graham-Rudman deficit ceiling. The prime target of congressional budget cutters is the Pentagon, but President Reagan has said he will veto any more cuts in military spending. House Budget Chairman William Gray said that could mean bad news for programs at home. What it would mean on the domestic side is that the $10 billion would have to come out of the remaining programs which would have a very significant impact upon farm programs, on transportation programs, on housing programs, and on water programs and other environmental programs. Graham Redman calls for uniform spending cuts if Congress can't get within $10 billion of the $144 billion fiscal 1987 deficit goal. In Arlington, Virginia last night, three people were injured too seriously when a homemade cannon exploded at a gas station. Authorities say a man was trying to sell the weapon when it accidentally went off. A round of ammunition was launched into a gas pump, setting off a tremendous fire and sending metal fragments flying. Police arrested two men fleeing the scene. In Southern California this morning, officials fear more scorching temperatures could set off another round of brush fires. Tuesday, fires roared through several hundred acres of brush forcing residents to evacuate quickly. Many homes in the Los Angeles area were damaged. It took several hours to contain the fires. Police are investigating the possibility of arson. In Moscow this morning, members of Anatoly Sharansky's family are preparing to leave. The Soviet government has issued exit visas to Sharansky's mother, brother, and his brother's family. They plan to fly to Vienna Sunday. The move comes just six months after Sharansky was allowed to immigrate to Israel. In Jerusalem this morning, there is a new twist to the story of little son Bordeaux. He's the young Indian boy we told you about with a glorious ancestry on an interesting pilgrimage. Martin Fletcher has more on the saga of little son from Israel. 
For Israel's national airline, flying Little Sun to Israel seemed a publicity coup. A Sioux Indian, a direct descendant of the great warrior Crazy Horse, and what's more, through his mother, a Jew. The airline El Al claimed Little Sun was the hereditary chief of the Aglala Teton Sioux Nation and arranged a welcome fit for a national leader. Even Israel's president, Chaim Herzog, came back from vacation to meet the little Indian chief who'd come to Israel for his bar mitzvah, the ceremony in which 13-year-old Jewish boys become a man. The trouble is, a leader of the Aglala Sioux in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, says he's never heard of Little Sun. There's no such thing as a Teton Sioux or a hereditary chief, and Crazy Horse died with no descendants. This left the El Al spokesman stuttering for an explanation. And, uh... In... And little son and his mother wouldn't answer any more questions. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Jerusalem. It is the most feared time in a professional football player's life, the Day of the Turk. Jimmy Suffalo will count the casualties next. Let me ask you, how did you sleep last night? I'm Ernest Williger. My company makes Stearns and Foster mattresses. Many people think they're the best mattresses made. I know they are. The finest materials go into every mattress. They're firm and comfortable and give you a great night's sleep. If you're not getting a great night's sleep, you should buy my mattress, Stearns and Foster. You can't get a better mattress or a better night's sleep. Victoria Herb. What? They finally found a substitute for the sweet roll. Hey. Nutigrains, almond raisins. What is this? Nuts and twigs? Try almonds, raisins, and these great flakes made with brown rice. But there's no sugar added. Herb, I you're gonna love the taste, even though it's healthy. Hmm. Hey, don't you have a story to write? How's this? Man eats healthy food and lives. The amazing taste of Nutrigrains almond raisin. It's news. And when the search for a truly mild soap ended, there was pure and natural, and nothing else. Pure and gentle. Pure and mild. Pure and natural. Through and through. It's the pure and mild soap for you. Pure and natural. And nothing else. Table for two, please. Yes, you'd prefer something in our smoking area, Philippe. Fine. How'd you know she smoked? Teeth, Orlando. Tobacco stains give smokers away. Not when you brush every day with Topol. Topol smokers' tooth polish with fluoride safely removes newly deposited tobacco particles and helps clean away built-up stains. Table for two, please. I have a charming table in our non-smoking area. Uh, no, no, we smoke. But your teeth, so clean, and he smokes. Topol, the only toothpaste a smoker needs. Jimmy Suffalo and I have just been talking about NFL cutdown day. Were you ever cut? No, I got up before they had the chance. Good morning, Bob. <laughs> NFL clubs begin serious preparation for the regular season later today as they take the practice fields with a reduced roster of 60 players each. The Turk paid a visit to some notable NFL lockers on Tuesday. More than 100 players were released, including 14-year veteran Dave Dalby, who spent the past 10 years as the starting center for the Oakland and Los Angeles Raiders. The Raiders also released Earl Cooper, a former first-round draft choice of the San Francisco 49ers. But for the second day in a row, the headliner goes to the Buffalo Bills. One day after signing quarterback Jim Kelly, the Bills traded running back Joe Cribbs to the 49ers in exchange for a couple of draft choices. Cribbs was the AFC Rookie of the Year in 1981, but the 28-year-old Auburn product jumped to the USFL in 1984, spending a season and a half with the Birmingham Stallions before returning to the Bills. In baseball, a couple of American League hitters rolled lucky sevens last night. Frank White drove in seven runs, which included a leadoff homer in the bottom of the 11th inning to power the Kansas City Royals over the Texas Rangers 9-8. And Lou Whitaker has seven RBIs and a doubleheader as the Tigers and the Angels split a pair. The Detroit second baseman hit a two-run homer in the opener in a losing cause, then came back in the nightcap with five RBIs to help the Tigers gain a split. In other action, Minnesota defeated the Red Sox 5-1, Seattle beat the Yankees 7-3. The Mariners have now won four in a row. Toronto was a 5-1 winner over Chicago. Oakland topped Baltimore. And Milwaukee defeated the Indians 5-3. In the National League, Jim Deshaies combined with Dave Smith on a four-hitter for the Astros. 
They got some defensive help from center field Billy Hatcher, who robbed Rafael Belliard of a base hit. Houston pitchers have now blanked the Pirates for 33 consecutive innings. Elsewhere, Philadelphia edged the Giants 6-5. Ron Darling beat Fernando Valenzuela in a 6-4 New York win over the Dodgers. San Diego beat Montreal 7-1. It was Cincinnati over St. Louis and Atlanta over the Cubs 7-2. And finally, two-time Olympic gold medalist Edwin Moses set a new men's track and field record by winning his 117th consecutive event. Moses won the 400-meter hurdles at a meet in Malmo, Sweden, breaking the previous victory mark held by American shot putter Perry O'Brien. And that's it in the world of sports. He box. just keeps on keeping on. Yeah, it doesn't seem he wants to lose just yet. Thanks, Jimmy. There are some Texas-sized weather temperatures to consider this morning. Joe Woody will do just that and have the national forecast next on NBC News at Sunrise. It's the WMC Station's Labor Day Festival featuring the first annual amateur catfish cooking contest. Bring your own cooker and secret recipe out to Shelby Farms and we'll supply the fish. Entry fee is only $5 and you could win up to $500. Entry forms are available from WMC at 1960 Union or call 726-0555 for details. It's all part of the fun at the WMC Station's Labor Day Festival at Shelby Farms. Monday, September the 1st from noon till 6. Brought to you by your WMC Stations and Bud Light Beer. I sing opera. I was referring to Oprah Winfrey. Oh, I love that woman. Sometimes she make me laugh, and sometimes she make me cry. Come, we go. Your show starts in September. That means I'll see you soon. Oprah! Oprah! Oprah, oh, Oprah Winfrey, 10 weekday mornings starting September the 8th on TV5. Line Hotel and Casino in Wendover, Nevada is reopened this morning. It was closed early Tuesday morning because of a gas leak. Officials say a faulty pipe joint that vents gases from the hotel's boiler room is to blame. More than 80 people were treated by paramedics at the scene. Many complained of nausea, headaches, and shortness of breath. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Bob. You're right. They know how to do it big in Texas, don't they? They sure do. It's going to be unpleasant there. Uh, another hot one today. Yesterday, it was a sizzler. Good morning, everyone. 17 cities from Texas to California hit record highs yesterday in the 80s, 90s, and 100s. And in Texas, it was just too hot. Abilene, 105. San Antonio, listen to this, 108. An all-time high, breaking the record set way back in 1919. Ask Grandpa about that one. On the weather map today, you'll see some heavy thunderstorms in the central and northern Plains states. Keep a weather eye there. And for you folks in Carolina, North, South Carolina, and Virginia, you've had some heavy rain of two to four inches in local spots, causing some flooding, I know. Look for some more local heavy thunderstorms today. Back behind that, scattered thunderstorms on the western side of the eastern mountains. Down in southern Texas, a chance of some showers to cool you off a bit. But in the west, beautiful sunny skies for the most part. Seattle, sunny by the afternoon, 80 degrees. San Francisco, 75. L.A., hot and dry at 97. And in the mountains, the Rocky Mountain states, keep a weather eye for some scattered thunderstorms there. Chicago, 84 degrees with some clouds trying to move in. Boston, cloudy, 75 degrees. Showers by later on tonight. Dallas, sizzling at 99 degrees. Now, in the northern plain states, you'll see some cool weather drop down from Canada, meaning temperatures down into the 70s, along with the rain and the cloudy sky. The hot 100 over southwest Texas and, of course, the desert southwest itself. That's the national weather. Now, here's what's happening in your neighborhood. 70 degrees and clear in Midtown Memphis right now, up to the upper 80s today under partly cloudy skies. Slight chance of a thunder shower. winds in the northeast at 12. Much more later. Bob? Thanks, Joe. Relief that tax reform finally arrived has been followed by anxiety in the business community. Alan Abelson tells us how tax reform will affect business when we return. I'm John Palmer. This morning on Today, the budget battle and what it means to you. I'm Lee Thompson. Also, Superman, Christopher Reeve, and rocker Lou Reed. This morning on Today. What? No banks? No finance companies? At Royal, we carry it all. We. If you're looking for luxurious five-piece king-size bedroom group, for the next few days, you'll find this exciting big new city special. Look, triple dresser, twin mirrors, king-size bed, and five-drawer chest in medium oak finish. Not the $400 you'd expect to pay, but super saving price for only $299 at Royal Discount. Free delivery, free layaway, free parking, and we carry our own account. 
Start your day off right with Wake Up Call. Look this morning, the battle between the United States and the Soviet Union to gather intelligence. Lately, the Soviets have been employing sophisticated new equipment that allows them to see and hear more than ever. Ann Garrels is the reporter for this two-part nightly news series, much of which is already known to both sides and has appeared in government publications. On a morning like this in June 1980, computers at the Strategic Air Command headquarters flashed reports that Soviet missiles were bearing down on U.S. targets. Skybird, this is attack command center. Bombers and missile crews were alerted. Calls were placed to confirm the report. An airborne command post was launched. Three minutes later, the alert was called off. There had been no attack, only a computer malfunction. But because these unprotected open phone lines were used, U.S. intelligence officials believed the Soviets heard everything. Dr. Bruce Blair has studied military communications for both the Pentagon and Congress. By listening in on these same conversations during actual hostilities, the Soviets, uh, even Moscow, might learn of American decisions on the launch of nuclear weapons even before our own forces do. Today, 70% of U.S. telecommunications move through the air, either by microwave or satellite signals easily intercepted. Of the nation's 200 million phones, only 3,000 are protected with scramblers, and even they are not used as often as they should be. And the Soviet secret police takes full advantage of that. From the Soviet embassy, just five blocks north of the White House, the KGB directs the eavesdropping operation, targeting Americans in all walks of life. Military men and military contractors, bankers, grain dealers, politicians, and journalists. The centerpiece of this Soviet effort is just down this highway outside of Havana. Lourdes says the Pentagon is the Soviet's largest overseas spy base. 28 square miles of antenna fields and satellite receivers manned by 2,000 Soviet technicians. From a nearby airfield, modified bear bombers fly eavesdropping missions along the U.S. coastline. Lourdes is an intelligence gold mine. It's able to monitor uh, communications from the uh, uh, Atlantic Fleet Headquarters at Norfolk, Virginia. It's monitoring uh, high-frequency communications uh, from the United States to Latin America, uh, including communications from the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. They've got 100% of the satellite communications uh, blanketed. The base also processes tape recordings made by 100 agents at eight Soviet diplomatic sites in the United States. Intelligence officials say the Soviets hide microwave dishes inside small white shacks atop the UN residence in New York City and at their consulate in downtown San Francisco. Dishes are also located behind the windows at a recreational complex on Long Island Sound near major defense contractors and at Pioneer Point, Maryland, near U.S. intelligence centers. At the Soviet Embassy in Washington, antennas can tune into the Pentagon or State Department, the CIA headquarters in Virginia, or limousines carrying cabinet secretaries. The new Soviet Embassy is even better positioned for eavesdropping. The administration's solution? Money, and lots of it, just to protect telecommunications from current Soviet technology. The National Security Agency, America's own eavesdropping agency, is developing a cheaper, high-fidelity, secure phone, which officials say is spy-proof. At least two and a half million phones will be needed. The cost? Five billion dollars. Computer security could cost billions more, and the battle will continue. For in the age of the electronic spy, the air is filled with secrets. Ann Garrels, NBC News, Washington. We'll have more news in a moment. Then Alan Abelson joins us to tell us how tax reform will affect business. Then Joe Whitty has a look at the weather. Here are some of our top stories this morning. White House denial, dashed hopes, and homeless plight. Now the details. The White House is denying published reports that President Reagan is considering tougher sanctions against South Africa. Aides say he is virtually certain to renew current limited sanctions, but he has no plans to impose any new ones. Chief of Staff Donald Reagan says the president is trying to build bridges to all factions in South Africa, and new sanctions would make that task more difficult. Moscow has dashed hopes that it's ready to move toward improved ties with Israel. The Kremlin says there will be no more talks with the Israelis following Monday's breakdown, 
of the two nations' first official contact in 19 years. Those talks in Helsinki broke off 90 minutes after they began, when Israel questioned the status of Jews in the Soviet Union. It's no longer a crime to sleep in public in the city of Santa Barbara, California, but you still can't do it overnight in a public park. Santa Barbara's city council last night killed a law that banned sleeping in public overnight, but it then voted to close its parks from dusk to dawn. Santa Barbara is home for about 2,000 homeless people, some of whom brought their case to the city council. If you don't come in here with $1,500 a night to spend in the hotel and spend a lot of money, they don't want you around. Our constitution says we the people. We are part of the people. We are part of the citizens of Santa Barbara. The Santa Barbara City Council's action makes it likely the city's homeless will carry through on plans for public protests. Convicted murderer Randy Wools was put to death early today in Huntsville, Texas. Wools, who had a history of drug abuse, was found guilty of beating, slashing, and burning a drive-in movie cashier seven years ago. Before his execution, he said for the first time that he felt sorry for the victim and her family, and in his words, wished there was something he could do to make it all right. Litton Industries is taking the brokerage firm of Shearson Lehman American Express and its former employee, Dennis Levine, to court. Levine has already pleaded guilty to the largest insider trading case in Wall Street history. Litton contends that his actions caused it to overpay by about $30 million for its 1983 acquisition of the iTech Corporation. A combination of profit-taking and investors' concern over the course of the economy sent stock prices lower Tuesday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost almost seven points in relatively light trading to close at 1862.91. Standard & Poor's 500 stock index closed fractionally lower at 246.51. The price of gold at 9 a.m. in London was $375.25 an ounce. That's up 45 cents from yesterday's close in New York. The new tax reform bill may have created just two definite tax rates for individuals, but it has also created a high number of uncertainties for business. The bill is a dramatic change from the way business has dealt with taxes for three decades and a sharp departure from the philosophy of the Reagan administration just a half decade ago. Our business reporter, Barron's editor, Alan Abelson, continues his week-long look at the congressional compromise. Good morning. A very weak look indeed. Go ahead. W-E-E-K. Oh, I see. What effect is this going to have on the economy, do you think? Well, it's really a judgment call. I mean, obviously, until it happens, no one can say, but I'll say it anyway. I think it's going to be a negative, in the beginning anyway, on a weak economy which means that an economy that's teetering on the brink of recession could go over the abyss. This is a really sharp departure from what the Reagan administration's philosophy was in 1981. Boy, I'll say it is, Bob. You know, the sky was the limit as far as tax breaks went in 1981. It was, an, at least some critics charged, the biggest tax giveaway in history. And here we are in 1986, and the Reagan administration has turned itself on its head. Now it's trying to take away all those goodies it gave just five years ago. Investment tax credits and mm -hmm. depreciation. Goodbye to those, yes. But the oil depletion allowance stays. Yeah, I think the, first of all, of course, the uh, oil and energy patch generally is in bad shape. This would be a, a terminal application of tax reform if they really went through with it, I think, this time. But secondly, let's not forget that they are still great. They have enough money left to contribute to campaigns. They're a very good lobbying group, and they, they held on to theirs. Their breaks are still there. On two levels, this really is an increase in taxes for business. Oh, that's right, because, in fact, business really never paid the 47 or 8 percent nominal rate it was supposed to. Most, uh, the average business paid about 25 percent. They used all these tax breaks you mentioned. They went out and bought tax credits. Some big businesses, General Electric, for example, paid almost no tax at all. But that's over now with the minimum tax. That's right. They'll have, it's a very stiff minimum tax of 20 percent. It'll fall very heavily on companies that have paid little tax, on companies that have been in trouble, on companies like banks, which also traditionally pay very few taxes. It's going to be difficult to start a new business. I think, well, if you have the spirit and the gumption, I think you'll find the cash somewhere to do that. I, I wouldn't say that's too bad a deal under this tax. Thanks, Alan. We'll continue tomorrow. Okay. Call it the dog days of August, the silly season, whatever. We have some examples when we return. <laughs> Maiden Form makes the most wonderful bras, panties, and lingerie for women like me. And me. And me. And now when I buy two, Maiden Form gives me one free. Imagine, 
I buy any two beautiful colors and get another one free. I can try exciting new styles, fabulous new looks. Buy any two and get one free from Maiden Form. For me, for me, for all the beautiful women I want to be. Not my fault, Mom. Sneakers just smell. But not anymore. Now there's Sneaker Tamers. Sneaker Tamers comfort insoles packed with supercharged microscopic charcoal. Billions of tiny odor magnets attracting and annihilating ferocious sneaker odor. And so tough, they're guaranteed for the life of the sneakers. Sure, these are my sneaks? Sneaker Tamers, you go in every sneaker in this house. Sneaker Tamers from Odor Eaters. Tame ferocious sneaker odor. To the 140 million check writers in this country. Here's my check. Take note of this sign. When you see it any place, anywhere in the country or the world, Telecheck says your check is welcome. I have a check. And uh, this out-of-state license? No card to carry, nothing to join. Just look for the red and white Telecheck sign. A sign for all 140 million of you. Your first check? Yeah. Is it okay? Make that 140 million and one. Telecheck says your check is welcome. The Royal Marines fell one man short when they tried to break the world's stack parachute record. They were able to link together 23 men in a 200-foot snake above East Devon, England. Falling at 2,000 feet a minute, the team had about seven minutes to stack. The Marines have eight more days to try and beat the record, which is held by an American team. Meanwhile, the bubble burst on two members of the British Dangerous Sports Club. David Kirk and Hugo Spowers lost their bid to be double bubble crossers of the English Channel. Two weeks ago, they made a successful crossing in a helium-filled kangaroo. The pair ran into trouble Tuesday when their bubble sprang a leak under the tower bridge. They were eventually rescued by river police. Joe, you have some good news for the southeast. Yes, Bob, they certainly do. They've had about a week's worth of rain on and off here and there, but we're beginning to see some greening down in the south, for sure. Now, severely dry conditions still continue in parts of Alabama and western Georgia, but it's turning a little bit green in eastern Georgia and South Carolina thanks to some rain during the past week. It's still very dry up by Washington, D.C. However, today's map shows you some good news. There's rain showers moving up the eastern seaboard. Some of these will be locally heavy at times. During the past 24 hours, we've had two to four inches of local downpours in parts of North Carolina, providing some flooding conditions, but also some beneficial rain. Heavy rainstorms over the northern and central plain states. Out west, beautiful sunny skies. If you're thinking to get a little suntan, use some sunscreen out west and in the deep southwest for sure, because the sun will be bright and sunny. Comfort dry out west, but oppressively humid down, of course, in Dixie. And that's my sunrise outlook on this Wednesday morning. Be sure to have a good one. Bye. Thanks, Joe. John Palmer has this morning's preview of the Today program. Good morning, John. Morning, Bob. This morning, we'll talk with President Reagan's budget director, James Miller, about new projections of some $20 billion in additional budget cuts that have to be made to satisfy Graham-Rudman requirements, cuts that mean real trouble for Congress. We'll get a fresh first-hand...